uh, it being on or about 6.30 on Monday, May 4th, I'm going to call this uh, virtual meeting of the Eastern Conservation Commission to order. Um, you know, please note that clearly we're all meeting on Zoom. Um, a whole bunch of information and disclosures are attached to, or are they attached to the agenda anymore? Yes, second page. It's just okay, second page of the agenda. Um, and as per a previously agreed upon resolution, um, signing authority on any decisions tonight has been uh, passed on to myself and or Andrea. Um, and with that, um, 14 Morse Road has requested a continuance uh, to the 19th. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, motion for a continuance of 14 Morse Road to May 19th. I second that. Lundin, second that. All those in favor? All those aye. Lundin, aye. Spadia, aye. Thomas, aye. Great. Uh, Catino, aye. Uh, so next up, we have Depot Street, and this is a continuation from our meeting last week. And Andrew, you have, okay, I see you have a revised staff report. Let me just pull that up. You want to call, um, you want to, we have uh, Laura Krause promoted to start the project. Hi, Laura. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. Um, Andrea, it does say that the um, you par uh, disabled participant screen sharing. Uh, in order for me to pull up the plans and share them, I need to, I guess, be promoted. Oh, more importantly, I have to make Stefan the co-host because he knows how to drive this bus. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, Stefan. All right, just a moment. Turn my notifications off. Thank All you, right. Laura. Not a problem. Okay, Laura, you should be able to share your screen now. I can, great. All right, can everyone see it? Yes. Fantastic. Yeah. All right, so I'm Laura Krause with the Beta Group, and I also have a Darshan Javeri with me today uh, from Beta Group as well, and then Greg Swan from the town is here uh, to answer any additional questions. So, um, since the last time we were in front of you last week, so it's not that long ago, um, we've made some revisions to the plans per your request. So we added on the plan set, we added the locations of the um, internal vernal pool boundaries and then um, are showing the actual boundary, the, the bylaw vernal pool boundary of the vernal pools. And we've calculated the impacts to um, the bylaw vernal pools and it's 2,365 square feet of impacts associated with grading and um, installation, clearing, grading and installation of this uh, stone wall here. Um, so we quantified those impacts. We previously hadn't included the buffer zone to um, th this isolated wetland, which is the ice skating rink. Um, so we added those impacts to the 50 foot buffer zone into our waiver request. Um, and we calculated the inner the impacts to the inner 50 foot to the type two intermittent streams that are on the site. And the uh, total impacts within 50 feet are 3,012 square feet of impacts. Um, we also submitted seed mixes to be used um, both in the wetland restoration area, which um, this area here, uh, which we did do a, a zoom in here of that per the request of the commission, uh, showing a little bit more detail um, and including the restoration um, note here on the plans. And we, um, and the seed mix for that, is here and if I'm moving too fast just tell me to slow down um, this is the wetland seed mix that we are proposing all native species um, and then this is the seed mix for the conservation areas of um, where the slopes adjacent to the roadway will be stabilized next to woodlands or next to um, 
the wetlands basic and, and is a shade tolerant mix so it'll be a, um, a great conservation type um, seed that will provide wildlife habitat in those areas where there is significant wildlife habitat adjacent to the roadway. Um, we also discussed at the last meeting uh, locating signs um, along the roadway in the areas of uh, the vernal pool and the, uh, the ACEC and natural heritage mapped habitat. Um, so we did create an exhibit here showing where we would propose those signs um, in this location and in this location to kind of span this area here and then um, to both the east and west of the vernal pool the two vernal pool areas to show the um, migration area where they could be um, migrating across the roadway. Uh, we talked to our traffic sign people and they said that um, DOT wouldn't be able to fund these signs because they are not uh, tr like necessary for traffic and engineering purposes, um, but they are something that um, could be uh, included as part of the order of conditions if you wanted to, um, and the town would be taking care of those signs. Um, I guess that's kind of it for, oh, and then uh, we did include on the 100% design plans um, where we are proposing the seed mixes, we included those areas on the um, on the sheets for the contractor so that they're, they're on the sheets and they, you know, the contractor won't get that um, mistaken. Uh, so it, it's both in the uh, document as well as on the, um, the plan sheets. And, um, and I also wanted to just, uh, I, it was my mistake last week. Um, I said the wrong turtle and Mike, I, you know, you were uh, surprised that there were wood turtles out there. It was supposed to be the Blandings turtle and I apologize. <laughs> That's all good. Uh, <laughs> And uh, also there are mapped blue spotted salamanders out there. So oh, the vernal cool. pool habitat is um, important. So the signs are, um, are definitely a consideration for you. So I guess uh, that's it for revisions. Um, Andrea, I don't know if you want me to go over anything else. Uh, if you just want to shoot back to the potential vernal pool so you can show the difference between, um, so you can show the difference between a boundary in a disturbed area versus the normal 100 feet? Sure, yes. All right, let's zoom in. We'll use wetland D as the example since the, um, ver the mean annual boundary to the vernal pool is closer. So we, um, as you know, the hundred, your bylaw includes the 100 foot, um, the, in, the vernal pool boundary includes 100 feet measured from the mean annual boundary until it, it, it hits the existing disturbance. So as you can see, measured from the mean annual boundary, it measures 100 feet, but as you get to the roadway here, it stops at the existing uh, edge of disturbance. And then as you move back around where, where it, kind of leaves the edge of disturbance, it then becomes 100 feet again. So that's how um, the, the impacts were quantified was from the existing edge of disturbance to the proposed edge of disturbance. And that's a good area because um, if you like stone walls, what, what uh, there is a stone wall at the current edge of disturbance and they're relocating it mm -hmm. back. Is that correct, Laura? That Yes, that is correct. Yep. Big fan. Mm -hmm. I have no other comments. I put some recommendations in my um, in my updated staff report. Oh, the silt fence at the erosion control line. That is correct. Oh, um, so we did also add a. Um, potential or uh, the use of silt fence in conjunction with uh, the the compost filled silt sock at the uh, limit of work for the areas where we're within mapped habitat on the south side of the roadway uh, in order to prevent wood turtles migrating into the work area during construction um, because the mapped habitat is only on the south side of the roadway trying to prevent them from moving into the construction area um, 
uh, we thought that was a good idea and uh, Andrea had recommended it. So we added that to the plans and they are, uh, that note is also um, here on the 100% plan sets. And then we, do in we did include a detail of that on the erosion control. Um, Uh, where are they? Here we go. Uh, this is the uh, compost fil filter tube and silt fence um, erosion control detail as well. Great. Um, well, it seems like you guys added everything in that we were uh, looking for and got us the details that we were looking for. So I appreciate that. Um, does any, any of the board have any further questions? So I just had a question about um, Wetland D in that vernal pool, if we could just use that as a point of discussion, maybe we go back to that zoom in that you had here. There's a couple of points there I just want to ask and maybe clarify too. Sure. So um, on this, I mean, a couple things to notice here that, that there's additional disturbed land that's uh, on, the, on the east side of this uh, wetland. I mean, there's a home there. <laughs> the, home, the home is within the vernal pool boundary with undisturbed land. So I mean, that vernal pool, the 100 foot from the mean high water mark, actually probably stops at whatever uh, developed land is there mm -hmm. on that. that yeah, I, I agree with you. Feet. So, I mean, that, that's decreased. I mean, that really isn't, you know, I mean, that's just further um, evidence probably that this vernal pool probably goes away from that, that whatever habitat is in there. Mm -hmm. um, another thing I just want to ask about this. So, um, where, where the stone wall is currently is um, is right. It's hard to sort of see because it's, it's yeah I see it now. <laughs> so when you, you're going to move that back, how many feet is that? Excellent, uh, thank you, Darshan. I don't I don't know exactly, but I believe it is about ten feet. But I don't. Darshan, so, do you know? So, oh, sorry, I'll let you answer. <laughs> sorry. Um, hi, this is Darshan Javeri from Beta Group. Uh, so it's about eight eight feet or so, plus or minus. Uh, the stone wall is a little below the grade right now, so it's going to just push it down uh, about eight feet or so. So in, in the disturbance that's going to happen in the vernal pool there, how much additional disturbance in sort of rebuilding that wall do you think is going to hurt? It? It's temporary. I assume that's temporary. Additional disturbance associated with installing the wall? Yeah. So, 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 so the wall is going to move about eight or ten feet, and I assume that in order to install the wall, you're going to have to disturb additional area beyond the wall itself. So there, there is a, a um, some area beyond it where the erosion okay. control yeah. boundary is installed. What, what, the erosion control controls will be installed. Pardon me. Um, and there is grading and clearing associated along this slope here. Um, yeah. But the the limit of work is the erosion control barrier. Okay, great. great. I just wanted to to clarify that. So that's all. Great. I'll take a great. shot. Thank Carol, you. anything? Yeah. Thank you. Um, What's the track record on the use of silt fencing to contain turtles? Um, it was uh, the reason I came up with it, and Laura, you can, I'm giving you time to think. Um, the reason I suggested it is because on a project in town that the Natural Heritage issued a conservation um, permit for. Uh, for a, a turtle species, that was the mitigation they required to um, keep the turtles in place. Okay, good answer. Laura, anything to add? I think that that kind of, I mean, I've seen it used on similar type of projects. Uh, we're working on a couple of projects with um, with turtles uh, in the area and they've, they're using similar protection methods. So I agree. And I've heard of that been used before as well, and I think that's a, a good way of going about it for sure. Great, thank you. One more question. Well, a little string of questions. Um, thanks for uh, getting the seed mixes um, changed up a bit. Um, where those mixes are going, what's the soil going to be? Is it still going to be the loam? Um, is it, 
why is the choice appropriate? What's the grade in those areas? And what's holding the seed and soil in place until it's established? We are proposing loam and seed. Uh, it will be loam um, and then graded in, uh, raked in. Um, the slopes are, uh, they vary along the corridor, but um, there's no additional, like the, the seed will be what, what we're using for stable, stabilization, but there is erosion controls at the down gradient limit, which will prevent any erosion into the downgrading areas during sta uh, during stabilization and establishment of the seed mix. Right. Yep. I just don't, you know, in any part of the roadway where those seeded areas are, you know, I don't know where the, where the water, um, the rainwater, stormwater flows over the edges of the road and might, you know, um, have an erosion impact. So that's why I was asking. Absolutely. Um, most of the roadway drainage will be collected in the new storm drainage system as well. So um, it, there'll be less runoff running off the road and less country drainage impacting those areas um, and resulting in erosion. Um, but because there will both have these compost filter tubes and the silts, silt fence installed there, um, there's really going to be a lot of protection. And then if there is an issue, it can always be graded back out and more seed can be installed. Right. Thank you. What are your what are your thoughts about putting a seed blanket down? On a particular slope. Right. If there's one that's steep, steeper than others or, or it seems more vulnerable to others. So um sorry, this is again Darshan. The slope is usually gonna uh, carry it in the project, but typical slope gonna be three to one slope uh, at the at the back of the sidewalk. So most of the cases will be, all these seeding will be done after the sidewalk is installed and the curbing is installed. Uh, so the slope will be have some protection for the blanket like type of stuff that contractor responsibility until the seed is grown. Uh, so they are responsible to maintain it uh, through the season to make sure they, it grows accordingly. Right, sounds good, thank you. Yeah. Oh. You want to go back to that spec? Are you sure. using a are you using a biodegradable cover on your on your silt fence on your silt silt sock? Yes, biodegradable okay. fabric. Yep. Great. And Carol, that's a good question. Bill, uh, Bill brought that up for uh, some uh, residential installations for the the seed blanket in the past. Um, I, I don't know if we can get it in some of the specific mixes we're looking for in some of the specific conservation areas. Um, but it's, uh, you know, something that maybe the contractors can consider if they have a particular rough spot um, that keeps getting washed out potentially. Um, yeah, Mike, any questions? No, I'm good. I have nothing to add. I'm pretty happy with what, I, what I've seen today. Great. John? Nothing for me. Looks good. Thanks. All right, awesome. Um, any public comment on the Depot Street project? Rick Swan put his hand over his mouth. Who? <laughs> <laughs> Got to call him out. <laughs> and now it's on his head. No. <laughs> You're like, sorry, Greg. Just sorry, with Andrew. Uh, all right, I'm not seeing any hands raised uh, for public comments. So would you guys like to uh, close? Yeah, um, great. I'm gonna go ahead and propose uh, a motion to close and issue a permit to work in order of conditions um, for the Depot Street Re uh, Reconstruction Project um, state number um let's see se 152-1630 and easton number 1604 uh with the <clears throat> special conditions noted in the staff report uh dated may 1st 2020 um and we are going to request that the uh wildlife signs be installed and located as described in exhibit a as, as noted in the notes um, and I would suggest that if, if there are areas of the slope and the conservation um, properties 
that, or I guess in the resource areas that require more than two attempts at restabilization for the seed to take um, uh, take hold, then uh, the contractors should use or should uh, seriously consider using a seed blanket to affect that uh, slope stabilization. Second. A question about that? All those in favor? Yep. Um, is that would that be at the contractor's expense? Do we and if so, do we have to specify that? Hi, uh, Stefan. Can I talk to uh, that uh, about that's it, it, it? It's the contractor's responsibility. It's through their means and methods to get the grass to grow. They may get to that point that they realize that they can't get it to. Um, get it to grow on their own and they will go through several, you know, they will work with DOT uh, to make sure it grows and they may get to the seeds, you know, the, the, the grass, the seed netting on their own. Um, but to make that a condition that they have to do this, they hamstring them. They may know a better way to do it. Um, in that I, I only suggested that they seriously consider it. Not, not that they, that they absolutely have to because I didn't want to, hand string them into that one thing but at least wanted to work it in there that we're recommending that they that they seriously consider using that okay as long as it's strongly considered okay. yeah thank yeah. you yeah I, I, again they're they're going to be they're the ones out there doing this every day not me um so they'll, they'll be the experts in, in getting it done but we uh we know we've seen it successful in projects in town in the past so uh, as long as they consider it Sounds good, thank you. Great. Um, did we finish the roll call? All those in favor? All fells aye. Lundin aye. Speedy aye. Thomas aye. Catino aye. All right, thank you guys. Thanks for all the work. Thank, thank you. you. Good. Good night. Take care, bye. bye. I'm gonna demote them. Um, and we have the next group is run by um, uh, Keith, Mike so, Keith, I seconded it. Okay, thank you. Call fell second. <laughs> <laughs> here, here. All right, 560 Foundry Street. I'm promoting Mike. I'm promoting Laurie McDonald. And Mike can tell us if anybody else is there for his group uh laurie mcdonald is going to be here as well she's going to talk a little later on in the presentation i brought okay. her in okay to a panelist all right and mike i'm assuming you're going to do the screen sharing that'd be great all right you should be all set to do it Okay, so I, I talked to Andrea this afternoon and put this together rather quickly. Um, this is just a kind of a layout of what we'd like to go over tonight and where we're going in future meetings uh, with this project. So for tonight, I wanna to talk to you about some alternative layouts for the Western side of the site that we've come up with since our last meeting. Um, that involves trail connectivity, which is the second subject. Uh, we also performed a wildlife habitat, a series of wildlife habitat evaluations on the site, and Lori's going to speak to that um, later on. Um, Angie and I had talked about, and I think we broached the subject the last meeting, about what I'm calling tiered permit, uh, which includes the home site, so that we have consideration for the impacts, not just of the, the roadway and the infrastructure, but also the home sites, and that way going forward when we do separate orders of conditions, we fairly well accounted for the impacts and the mitigation for those home sites, making future permitting for each individual home uh, a bit more straightforward. Um, talk to you about the mitigation areas that are proposed on the site, just go back over that. And ultimately, Stefan, what I'd like to get is some feedback from the commission um, on what we're gonna be now calling the current layout. And I'm gonna show you those in a few minutes, uh, some changes based upon um, comments and concerns that the commission had. So we've made some changes to the layout that I wanna go through with you. And then going forward into the next meeting, um, we have most of the draft 
uh, waiver request uh, in place. Um, we have a, a couple left to do. We want to send those in and then for the next meeting, uh, possibly in two weeks, have discussions about the draft waiver requests, uh, if we can get through um, all the other items tonight. So I'm going to beg your indulgence. We're probably going to take more than 15 minutes um, to go through this. So realizing that this is a fairly um, complex project. So I want to go to this first plan. This is the plan that was submitted as part of the notice of intent. And this is what we've been evaluating for impact, what we've been talking about all along. As you can see, it shows the original alignment of the roadway, which we've now shown you an alternative for that. And it shows the 20 home sites on the western side of the site. This is the western side of the site. So everything that I'm going to be talking about tonight really has to do with the western side of the site. The eastern side of the site remains the same. That's the redevelopment parcel. So there's not a lot of change over there right now, but we're talking about making some changes on this western side of the site. So this was the alignment that I showed you the last time, changing the alignment going through here to minimize impacts to wetland A and wetland B on this side. Now tonight I wanna to show you a new alternative and I've got four sub alternatives, if you will, to talk to the commission about. So this is a new alternative for the side of the site. It incorporates that realignment, the same realignment that we talked about the last time to minimize impacts on wetland A and wetland B. But now it also incorporates changes to minimize impacts to these three isolated wetlands. So you can see we've eliminated, this is actually an 18 home um, subdivision as opposed to 20 homes. So we've eliminated two houses over here and that enabled us to move around these isolated wetlands. So we're staying out of the isolated wetlands, all of them on this side of the site now. So this first alternative, uh, which is just sub option A, is, is just the subdivision. And it shows underneath, you can kind of see, these are, the, these are existing trails that are on the site. And so this alternative does not include parking or trail continuity. As we move forward into the next alternative, we add parking down here at the southern end of the, of the parcel. And we add a connection to this trail system to go off onto the conservation property. So that's the, that's the change here between A and B. This is B. We move to C. And we move that parking from down here, we move it up closer to the top where the where that fire road entrance is coming in. And then we add a trail connection behind these homes to connect up to the trail system. So that's the difference here. And then on D, we move the parking back down here, but we also keep parking up here. So we have the connectivity, the trails behind the homes here and the connection down here. Now, all of these, as we go from A to D, there are changes in the impacts and the changes in the impacts are not at all due to the subdivision. The subdivision remained the same throughout. Changes of impacts are due to the trails and the parking for the trails. And I know that's something that the commission has been very interested in. So we wanted to incorporate options in here to talk to the commission about. The differences are shown in this table. So if, if A, the base case with no parking and no trail um, connectivity has zero impact in all of these areas uh, due to the trails and the parking, there's, there's a progressive change in the impacts due to the other alternatives. So no matter what we do in order to add parking and trail continuity, there's going to be some additional impact to specific resource areas out there in order to be able to put this connectivity into the system. So, Stefan, one of the things I want to do is I want to get some feedback from um, the commission on the changes that we're proposing in these alternatives. So I don't know whether you want to do that now before I go forward any further in the conversation, if we can start a discussion between the commissioners and us, or if you want us to finish our presentation and then go through it. 
Um, why don't you go ahead and finish your presentation? Uh, cause you might have, you know, information further on that will be pertinent to any discussion we have around it. Sure. Okay. So then I'm going to very quickly, I want to turn this to Lori. Um, so she's going to talk about the wildlife habitat evaluations that we've been performing out on the site. She been promoted, Andrea? Yeah. Um, do you see her, Stefan? Lori McDonald? She was there when I started. Yeah, I see Lori. Uh, Mike, you, uh, you might need to either give her control or uh, stop sharing so she can share. I'll stop share. Lori, are you there? She um, she lost her mic and she doesn't and she doesn't have video. According to the icons. Yeah. Okay. You want her to sign out and sign back in again? Um. I guess uh, whatever makes it work for you guys. Uh, she yeah she she doesn't have access now so maybe that would work. I'll watch for her and the attendee. Okay, I'm not even sure if she's hearing us. She can also call in, I think, to the phone number. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have her text? Can you text, send her a text? I'm doing that right now. One thing while we're waiting for Lori and um, while Mike's texting her, and this is a bit of a, just a point of information that I, I want us to be very careful about how we talk about vernal pools um, because uh, there's basically three components in, in, in the way we should talk about them under the Easton bylaw, the vernal pool itself is 100 feet from the mean high water mark. Um, and so we get a little bit stuck when talking on the state regs, which is just the mean high water mark, and then there's 100 foot beyond that, it's the buffer. But under the, 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 the town bylaw, when we talk about vernal pool, we are talking about that 100 feet from the mean high water mark. So in mean, one of those tables, it, 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 Getting a little feedback now. No, it's me. Uh, can we mute her non dial in one? Yeah, hang on, I'll mute her. There we go. Um, so, so I think that we should just be very careful that we're all using the same language. And language. Yes, and we, yes. thanks, Rory. Thanks, We've Rory. been inconsistently doing that, showing. The, the actual pool, the vernal pool habitat, the 100 feet, and then the 100 to 200 foot buffer zone. Oh, um, Laura, even though you're muted, maybe turn your um, uh, co your computer audio off totally with the call in. Rory, thank you for that. Oh, nope. Yeah, that's a good point, Rory, because um, intrusion into the vernal pool buffer zone in the town by a law and for intrusion into the vernal pool itself uh, carries different, um, you know, requirements as far as uh, the, the, the bar that has to be met to be approvable. So um, I think we have to give um, 
Mike uh, to hill back the screen so we can see the um, so we can see that the, the wildlife evaluation plan that he wants to speak to. Yeah, um, Mike, you should be able to uh, go ahead and share your screen again. So I can share the screen, but I don't have this presentation um, ready. Lori has this presentation prepared for you. Um, um, let what, me see. Um, I'm trying meeting her again. Can you guys hear me at all? Uh, Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we're just getting some wicked feedback whenever we unmute you. Yeah, I don't know how to sh shut off. Do you, do you have Zoom shut off, Lori? Uh, on your computer on the bottom left hand corner. Next to the mute button, there should be an uh, an up arrow that brings up the audio and you can click on computer audio and disconnect. Here, I'll, I'll, um, Is that I'll share my screen so you can see it, Lori. Um, all right, so Lori, I don't know if you can see me here. Um, well, I guess if you're sharing a screen, it's in the top up here. And it's right up here where you're muting. There's the drop down. And if, if you click on it, it brings up the audio control here. And then the computer audio, I'm disconnected on my computer, but you should be able to connect or disconnect uh, your computer audio here. And once you're disconnected, that should help out with the, um, uh, with the feedback. And we'll try again in just a sec. Can you do I Hi, Laura, are you there? Still a feed Oh, man. So one suggestion that I have is that she just leave the Zoom meeting and then just stay on the phone. Yeah. Yes. Yep. She won't be able to see the, pit, the, the site plan, so I hope you know. That's okay. Right, Laurie. That's okay, Andrea. I'll share it, and we're just using that as a backdrop anyway. Okay, so let's see. All right, looks like she's now. Let's try this. Okay, so All can right, you hear Lori, me? Are you there? Oh, yes, oh, I'm here. That's better. Okay. All right, great. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing. So, Mike, you can go ahead and share again. Okay. Okay, so are the plans up on yes, the screen? Are. Okay, great. Um, so I started the um, evaluation process by first going out to the site and, with GPS and um, collecting features via GPS. And I was looking for mainly nests, tree cavities, burrows, ground burrows. Um, and I, I um, captured those features along with some other features like um, brush and uh, tip up mounds, um, dead, both dead standing and live standing trees um, with, with cavities. And um, those are all on the plans within the impact areas. And um, also on the plans are some stone walls. I don't know I don't know if you can see those. There's there's small circular um, objects going down along. Um, I think that is wetland F. If you can see it, it's right to the um, east of wetland F. Those are all stone walls that were captured by our original survey team. Um, so here's stone walls here, here. I don't know if you can see. Stone walls here. Okay. Okay. Yep, and. Um, 
right, so all those features were captured using GPS. Um, cavities were, were estimated visually, um, and the distance from the ground associated with each tree cavity was also estimated, as well as nest height in trees with the, the height of the nest were estimated as well. Um, I then use New England wildlife, habitat, natural history, and distribution uh, document put out by Richard DeGraff and Marikio Yamasaki um, to determine which habitats were on site. And um, in that way, I can see which species may be available on site using the habitat. So the two habitats that were available or swamp hardwood, red maple, that um, is located mainly along wetland A to the east of the um, site. And then um, oak pine, uh, white pine, northern red oak, and red maple forest is to the west of the site. There's a pink dash line that separates the two um, habitat forest cover types. Um, so the main features are located, um, actually, I then uh, took a look at the riverfront um, areas using the, uh, the, um, the DEP uh, field forms and gathered information associated with the field forms as far as which habitat um, features were present within riverfront area for uh, Beaver, Creek, Beaver Creek and Riverfront area for Mulberry Brook. And those are attached to uh, the appendices in the evaluation. Um, basically, I want to talk to you about the two um, riverfront areas and the upland knoll area. Um, one thing I did note in the uh, evaluation was the presence of a significant number of cavities both in um, upland and what, uh, mainly in upland and riverfront area associated with um, Mulberry Brook. Um, there were a significant number of cavity, cavities in both uh, dead standing wood and live trees. Um, there were also a um, significant amount of hard mass massed on the site, um, mainly due to the presence of um, the the oak and um, oak and I'm sorry. Uh, with the presence of oak and shagbark hickory, and you could see that mainly in the riverfront area down along Mulberry Brook, where there were presence of um, middens, uh, a lot of. Um, stockpiling and caching of uh, acorns and um, and uh, other hard mass material. Also in the, um, in the southern part of the site along the riverfront area of Mulberry Brook, there was an abundance of coarse wood such as down um, trees, um, tip up mounds, and um, various decayed um, types of um, logs and and, um, and the like. Um, in the upland knoll area between the the um, between the stone walls, I don't know if you can point that out, Mike. Yeah, yeah. There was there was not a, there was a very low amount of downed wood and um, cover in that particular area. Um, there, there was uh, a few ground burrows in that area. I, I located four ground burrows. The burrow analysis that I completed was just randomly breaking aside one square meter um, plots um, within the impact areas. And I only located four, um, I believe seven, approximately seven inch di diameter ground burrows in the upland knoll area. Um, there were minor amount of burrows down along the Marbury Brook Riverfront area as well, and only one that I located um, over along um, 
the Beaver Brook Riverfront area impact. Um, so I'm not sure what else I can speak to you about. Um, one uh, another thing I did notice far, as far as soft mast, such as berries, there um, there were a significant amount of um, soft mass in the wetland A system, um, consisting of mainly arrowwood, multi-floor rose, um, slippery dogwood, northern arrowwood. Those very um, there were a significant number of berry producing species in in the wetland A area. Um, down along the riverfront area along Mulberry Brook, the soft mass consisted of mainly buckthorn and buckthorn and spice bush. That was the other um, very producing shrub species in that area. Um, as far as habitat for vernal pool species, I did not find a lot of burrows. Um, and one reason I think may, um, may account for the limited number is a high groundwater table. I don't think there's a lot of mammal activity ground, such as um, voles, moles, and, um, and the like on site. So overwintering habitat specifically for spotted salamander and other mole salamanders, uh, I think is minimal on the, on the, um, pro in the project area. Um, there's, there is a presence of, um, let's see, of good dispersal activity of dispersal opportunities. There is a um, good option for uh, ref refuge, um, places to um, to take cover with all the um, coarse wood, especially along Mulberry Brook because of the abundance of coarse wood down along the south of the site in the riverfront area. Um, it is mesic habitat, a uh, very um, wet uh, area down in the south of the site. So it would be good for dispersal of um, both uh, wood frog and um, wool salamander. And I'm, I'm, these species tend to, to um, migrate long distances. So although there is um, limited overwintering habitat within the limits of the impact area, um, they may be using the site um, to move to locations um, past the property or outside of the property to overwinter. Um, one thing about the the walls, I think the walls may be providing a barrier for mole salamanders in particular. Um, I think the the uh, the walls would be would be limiting the use of the upland knoll. The mole sandal, salamanders, I would, I believe, would would potentially move around the walls to access um, any overwintering habitat that they're seeking. Um, I think that's about it as far as my analysis. There, there were. Like I said, significant number of cavities. When I was out there, I saw um, a variety of cavity nesting bird species. Um, hairy woodpecker, uh, black capped chickadee, um, those two species I specifically saw on site. Um, they were both engineered and natural cavities. So um, given the, the availability of um, the the uh, the dead wood that's present on the property. Um, the, there's both good food source and as far as um, ores 
pine borer beetle and other types of um, boring insects for in ants for a lot of these cavity nesting species, um, as well as habitat for nesting. Uh, at this point, I guess, if, are there any questions in particular about the evaluation that you're interested in um, asking? Uh, real quick, you didn't come across any signs of maybe otters being back there? I did not, no. Hmm. Yeah, I was um, back. I, Sorry, go ahead. Most, they seem to be on the rise right now, so I wouldn't be surprised right. if they were, if they are present. Yeah, I think I, I in around January, February, I think when I was out there, maybe it was even December now, um, I definitely think I came across some signs of them, uh, specifically in the form of scat, but you know, no, no, 100%, but just curious if you saw them, so. Yeah, I didn't see any scat, I, but I mainly focused my evaluation on the western side of the site, west of Weaver Brook. I didn't look to the east, so. Okay. And I focused in the Where's impact right? areas. Okay. Well, so, but, uh, sorry, you did see evidence of vernal pool species, and and at least in the uh, let's see, and let's see what, what's the title of the wetland in wetland A, and just here. What, when I was out at the property, I did hear chorus and yeah. wood frogs uh, one of the days yeah. I visited the site. And then um, four toed salamander, I located one individual in wetland E, the smaller lobe of okay. the pool. It was a male. Mm -hmm. Yeah, someone threw out there too. I, I realized when I was out there last, it seemed like a real significant coyote habitat as well. Um, it seemed like there's a lot of uh, coyotes moving through there frequently. So just throwing that out there. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Um, Rory, any questions, comments on this so far? So just to, were you, you were out there two different times, is that, or at least two different periods, one, one in 2019 and, and 2016? Um, no, I actually just, I was just out there this year, um, and I was out there April 11th and April 17th to, to work on, no, in April 6th and 7th um, to collect information concerning the wildlife habitat okay. available on site. And Rory, so last, year, in April. last year in uh, 2019, um, this is Mike Tuhill, last year in 2019, before Lori was with us, we had Lucas Environmental out there as part of when they were doing delineation and uh, Matt Verrill is a wildlife biologist with, with Lucas and he did some uh, evaluations last year. That must have been where I picked that up then. Yeah. yeah. That was all part of the ANRAD process. And they did identify um, spotted salamander um, egg masses in vernal pool E, as well as wood frog in E. And then they also identified wood frog in A. Right. This is, this is E up here, and this is A down here, bisected by that stone wall. Okay, great. I, yeah, it looks like you put some good work into the, into the study and we found some things. Um, Carol, questions, comments? Sure. Uh, it was quite a bit of work for you to have done that. So good job. Um, mm. uh, I didn't, I know I read the report. I looked at every page. <laughs> I know that most of the trees there are red maples in the wetter areas, but you also have quite a few uh, oak trees. And I'm glad that you mentioned chickadees because they are my favorite bird by far. Mm. So uh, in table three, in that document, you have a chart and the rows are uh, different plant types of plants, herbaceous yeah. and um, woody perennials mostly. And then the columns are what kind of food those plants provide to um, wildlife. And the other column is what wildlife eats that food. Um, 
what is to me a, a big black gaping hole that you don't have is you don't have anything uh, about insects. And by definition, insects are a wildlife value. Um, I do have four fun insect facts from Dr. Doug Talame, University of Delaware. This is his third book. It's kind of the uh, popular culture insect guy who's trying to help people uh, in their own yards uh, uh, have an ecosystem in their landscape that helps to protect uh, some of our species that are in deep decline. So uh, he knows a lot about the Lep Lepidoptera, the butterflies and moths, and that's just one of the many orders of insects that are in those, in those woods and wetlands. And a lot of the, the Mike Tuhill, one report you gave us today was the, the different uh, drawings, the B, C, and D, and, the, and your chart about the different square foot or square meters or whatever, whatever the units was about the impact area. So impact area is just one uh, aspect of impact. And I would like to share some other numbers with you. Uh, speaking of chickadees, my favorite bird, uh, Dr. Talame has found that one pair of nesting chickadees needs 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to rear one clutch of young. That's their family, that's their babies. And that's just one pair of one kind of little bird. So imagine all the other chickadees, all the other you know, birds in those woods that need tremendous numbers of caterpillars. Oak trees are among the keystone 5% of native plants that make 75% of the caterpillar food that drives, drives the food web. So caterpillars are really efficient at turning plant materials into protein. And that's why the birds need so many of them. And the oaks host the entire life cycle of over 500 species of Lepidoptera. And it's not only nesting birds that depend on them to feed their young. So again, I feel like your report was really lacking a big chunk of information there. And if that's something I could, um, I can see how that could, could, uh, could have helped the report. Thank you. And I, I mean, I guess to, to speak to that, uh, you know, in the time that I've been on the commission, I don't think that there's been a large focus on requesting studies on insects in a lot of these reports in the past. So that could be something that maybe it's not standard practice in the industry. Uh, I'm not speaking from experience inside the industry. I'm just, I'm just you know, speaking from observation because this topic has come up twice in the past two weeks. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's just not standard in, in, in the industry, because, again, I, I haven't really seen it mentioned in uh, previous, you know, um, habitat and um, uh, species reports that, that we've that we've looked at in the past, Carol. Thank you, Stefan. Yep. Um, OK, thank you, Carol. Good point. Uh, Mike. No, I, I got nothing to add. I, I said what I needed to say. I'm good. Okay, John? I have nothing to add, but I will um, state about the insect thing. I mean, back in 2009, before they kind of just, I guess, revised the National Heritage um, Certification for Vernal Pools, they used to go by faculative species. And they used to do different types of different faculative indicators, which included insects, but they got away from that. Um, with the revision back in 2009 and really primarily focused on, hmm. you know, more vernal pool species and whatnot. So, you know, that's, I don't know where the, the disconnect happened there and why they made that happen, but that kind of happened. So, you know, the focus of insects, you know, I guess is not really a, a factor right now, but, you know, it's definitely something to take into consideration. Yeah, I, I wanted to chip in on it there. because um, they're a, they kind of a, a, a what that make that the food web tick in our. In oh, our 
they're def- they're definitely important. Um, I-, I was just adding some context, um, you know, just based on what I've what I've seen, because um, you know, again, I-, I haven't seen it come up um, much in these reports in the past. And maybe to John's point, that's because you know, I, I don't know, maybe they got overlooked when the uh, the standards got rewritten, you know, some years ago. Um, all right, uh, uh, Mike Tool, you want to continue on with your presentation? Can I can I just add one question from Lori? Sure. Uh, Laurie, will you um, there? We've got the site plan, the 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 new uh, layout of the site plan up, and um, two smaller the isolated wetlands um, were uh, are no longer have houses over them. So I was wondering if uh, you want to speak to the wildlife uh, habitat of those particular areas. I think it's H. And uh, wetland H, I think it's wetland uh, H, F, and is it G? Yeah, F. And if you could just speak to to what's happening in the border and adjacent to the border of those areas, is that is that possible? Uh, sure. Um, so. As far as um, habitat value, what what will be gained by retaining those two areas is uh, dispersal, dispersal and refuge for um, amphibian species. I think that's the main gain you get from uh, maintaining those two areas and not um, directly filling or impacting them. And, <laughs> Thank you. So, Stefan, I, I, um, I, I just as a as a commission here, we we got a, a ninety page report about wildlife habitat. Um, yeah, I, I think we we've got a lot of information here. How, how do we now judge um, all these um, impacts that, that the development is going to have on these? habitats and try and understand the significance of that. I'm not a wildlife biologist, so I'm trying to learn as we go along here and, and understand. We, we've got this wildlife study, which shows us this is a very um, you know, important habitat for wildlife, various kinds. Um, and I, I'd like to think that we need now to understand how that impacts um, this development impacts that specific habitat and, and how we're going to mitigate that. And, and just to add to that, Rory, real quick, I, mm-hmm. even me being out there, um, I, I was even thinking about like even like maybe not doing the trail because of that. Cause I, for myself looking, it looked thriving. So I wasn't even sure. Like, I don't want to impact that too much either being having people out there. So, and, you know, go add a step on, but just a concern that I had. So. Yeah. Well, and you know, I, one thing I did want to touch on is, you know, it keeps being mentioned that the, the trail system there, there really is no trail system out there right now. I mean, you know, Mike, you did some, some ex- exploring back there, I did. Uh, you know, last I did. year. Yeah. There's no trail at all. Uh, there's a fire, there's an yeah. ATV trail to going to a neighbor, but the, other than that, there is not a sign of any trail that's walkable whatsoever, maybe from deers, but nothing right. real or true. Yeah. There's like some game, some game trails, but, we, we we thought that there might have been some trails in the neighboring conservation land, but there there really is no existing trail system back there. Correct. Correct. Yep. So so the main reason for the evaluation is to give you an idea of what would need to be mitigated on site to maintain what you're impacting. So that was mm-hmm. one of the reasons why um, course wood was added to the mitigation areas, as well as a variety of um, shrub species that would provide both, would provide both soft and hard mast foods. And also the coarse wood, as far as the question concerned in um, mitigating for loss of um, insect, insect foods for cavity nesters, such as chickadees, the coarse wood's going to provide, you know, decaying wood and habitat for a variety of um, ants and other insects. So 
that's one of the reasons um, a lot of these features were captured is just to give you an idea what a mitigation area should look like um, to keep those values in the in the um, the wetland system. And do we have any proposed mitigation uh, area overlaid onto any of these uh, plans? Um, we have the no. original one, Stefan, that we submitted earlier on. So we haven't changed mitigation areas A or B from what was proposed earlier. So the, the, the numbers, the square footage of impact has gone down, but the mitigation areas right now proposed are the same mitigation areas that were proposed early on in the process. Um, so, I mean, in my opinion, you know, I, I think that this looks to me like a step in the right direction. We've gone from filling in wetlands to not filling in wetlands and working in the resource areas. Um, you know, we're, we're still, you know, working inside the inner 50 foot in, in a lot of these. Um, so, you know, obviously you're going to have waiver requirements and it's going to be, you know, it's still going to come down to figure out the, uh, the, 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 the mitigation. We have a pretty good idea now of the wildlife habitat and the values that the, the property, you know, presents. You know, I think we knew that it was likely going to be a pretty good, um, you know, natural habitat area because it's been pretty undisturbed for a long time. Um, I think we have a little bit of a better understanding of that now. So yeah, I, I think you you hit the nail on the head, Rory. Um, you know how do we how do we square it, Andrew? I um, agree with you, Rory, that we just got the information a week ago. Um, but what we now have is good existing conditions, and I'd like to bring um, uh, LEC back as peer review to evaluate the um, all, the development. And its and its impact on wildlife. That's not not my strength. I'd like to have them evaluate that and give you some recommendations. I mean, I think our project the scope. I I I'm, I'm, think that's great. What and we'd the, like the project fees are significant enough that I can cover. Um, I can I can cover some more peer review without asking for additional funds from the consultant. But, but I, I guess, does it make sense to do that now? Do we think, do we think we're closer to a final enough answer? Um, you know, do, do we want to be going back and forth, study to study, study to study? Um, I didn't ask. Or do we want to get to tonight, some... um, I thought I wanted to get your feedback on uh, these. Uh, I want to get your, your sense of these projects. And then, then she would have a full then she would then she would know what questions you were asking rather than just evaluating it you know straight out she can't evaluate every single proposal she has to evaluate what you most like and that's that's what i was going to say andrea right. what i would propose before claire takes the next step in in doing additional evaluations that we need to provide you and her with the impact numbers from the revised alternative on the western side of the site. And so part of my goal tonight was to see if this, I, I think I'm still sharing my screen, see if this alternative or a sub alternative, which includes some parking for trails and things like that, if, if this alternative looks like it is doable from the commission standpoint so that we can move forward and get the, um, the numbers for this alternative, the same way we did for the first alternative, show the, it's going to be a reduction impact, show the reductions in impact, show the mitigation areas, and get that package of waivers put together so that we can talk about an alternative that, that we have nailed down pretty much, and we can develop the waivers for this particular alternative. And I think that's that's when Claire, um, you know, as we develop the numbers for this particular alternative, that's when, when Claire's time would be well spent. 
Oh, I, I think, um, and you know, you guys on the board can, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're more interested in the actual impacts than necessarily the reduction in impacts from a, you know, a proposed plan to another proposed plan. Um, I mean, it's clear that there's a reduction in impact because we've gone from filling in wetlands to not filling in wetlands, but what's more important is the actual impacts than the reduction in impacts from one piece of paper to another piece of paper. Okay, I agree. And so we, we that's, need to that's develop my opinion. Them. I mean, that's just... Right. So we need to develop those, but to develop those, I'd, I'd like to get a feeling from the commissioners about the alternative that we're showing you tonight. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if anybody else wants to call in, and I, I think it's a step in the right direction. Um, one thing I question is, you know, we still have some houses that have the parking in the back versus the parking in the front. I can't tell from looking at this if parking in the front versus parking in the back results in a deeper lot or not, which is more or less impactful. But, um, I know the planning board wants a mix. You guys want an approvable project. We want what's less impactful. So right. whatever is going to be less impactful on this side, uh, whether it's parking in the front, parking in the rear, um, the less impact is going to get this to be a more approvable project. So planning board might have to, to wiggle on that front um, as far as their aesthetics goes, because we're talking about actual impacts to, to, um, to habitat and to wetland functions, um, not just looks. Um, so I, I, um, can, can you can you guys can you guys comment on that at all? Do, do you have a sense for what lay is one layout versus the other, more or less uh, actual square footage of impervious on a lot? No, but that's something that I'll I'll bring back, and we can certainly do that analysis. That's that's good can feedback. I, that's something we can look at. If um, the least impact from a wildlife standpoint would be having the parking up closer towards Route 106. That would be the least Oh, um, I, I'm sorry, Laura. I don't mean the uh, the additional parking um, okay. for like trails and stuff. Um, you mean I, the driveways? I like the, uh, the driveways, okay. yeah. Although her point is well taken. Yeah, yeah although well, your point is well taken. So Stefan, I think your your question is, is does, does a layout like this where you have the the driveway in the back of the house lead to more impact than something like this where the driveway just comes straight into the front of the house. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And we'll look at that. Um, you know, I'm still concerned that I see, you know, a not insignificant amount of work uh, inside the 50 foot in a lot of these uh, in, in a number of lots. Um, you know, so so while we're, we've gotten away from filling in wetlands, which is, I think, a great step in the right direction, um, you know, working inside the 50 foot in, you know, one, two, three, four. This right here. Um, you know, th those, yeah, those, those lots right there. Right. Uh, those aren't encroaching as much. You know, a simple flip in the lot layout might get you out of the 50 foot in those. I'm not sure. Uh, but over on the left-hand side of that section, on the other side of Sawmill Road, you have a few mm -hmm. lots that are inside the 50 foot on the isolated wetlands. Oh, here, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and there, that, that house is almost entirely inside the 50 foot. This one, uh, this one quite a bit. Yeah. Little, little Those bit right there. Yeah. Looks like just like a little bit of the backyard, maybe not so much of the structure. There will be a little bit right. of work there. Right. So, you know, th those are a couple things. I you know I, I, it looks like, you know, you guys clearly tried to stay away from the vertical pool uh, boundary, which I think yeah. is great. Um, so uh, I, th I think that's kind of some of my feedback and I'll open it up to the board for their feedback on this uh, you know, proposed change. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the fact that, um, it, that it has been designed to reduce an awful lot of impact would I know they lost two home sites out of it, but it's definitely a, a much friendlier footprint um, than was originally proposed. Um, you know, very little of this is, it's pretty, I'm just stating a fact here, not not, a, not an acceptance of it. I'm just simply saying that um, 
very little impact of the actual vernal pools themselves. Um, there is still a good amount of war work in the vernal pool boundaries. Um, and that's why I think it's going to be important for us to understand the wildlife habitat impact. Um, but um, this is, uh, as Stefan has stated, a step in the right direction. I don't know that I have enough um, information yet to know if the parking should be in the north of the property or the south of the property, which one's less disturbing. You know, Mike's point about maybe not having a connecting trail from the north side to the south side and simply going down the roadway may be the best approach. Um, from an impactful standpoint to the, the habitat, um, you know, I, I don't, you know, if we want to access the, the trails south of the, the or, or a trail south of the property on conservation land, um, you know, try, probably try and hook up with the Bay Circuit Trail at that point, um, but that, you know, may be coming down the roadway to get there as opposed to through the road. But those are things I think we have to talk about. Um, it's a challenge for sure, you know. And, and I, you know, I think to to get to the hundred percent, you know, threshold here of staying out of fifty foot or the vernal pools themselves, uh, you're probably losing six more houses, you know. So, Mike, um, I would like to add that um, somewhere in our regulations, uh, the applicant has, has a burden of providing credible proof that the proposed activities will have no adverse effects on any of our wetland values. So I'm especially concerned about that inside the foot 50 foot area. And um, you know, mitigation, as you said last time, it can take, you know, years for mitigation area to become high functioning, and there's no guarantee that it ever will. You know, if you take out a 60 foot oak tree, it can't, its function uh, and value in the ecosystem can't be replaced by a six foot oak tree. And that's just one tree, and we're in an ACEC here. So I'm not. I'm not sure how to get past this. I mean, if I'm wrong here, please tell me what part of no adverse effect do I not understand? Um, just to, as a point of information, this, the, the, um, this is 503.22b2. Um, the statement is no significant adverse effects. So there, there is a qualifier there. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. I, I don't want it lost. It I, I understand the point 100%. And it's the same point I think that Stefan and, and I raised earlier about trying to, to make sure that, that we are not having impacts on this wetland um, that you know are, are detrimental to the wetland resources. And I, so I agree with you. I just want to be clear what, what the regulation actually does allow. Sure. Yep. I think I think probably that came from the in a notice of intent application. That, uh, that's a requirement. But that's I think that's what the language is. Where would that be? But I think that's the waiver. But in the waiver standard, it goes to significant. Okay. I, they, they know they've got waivers here to, to, to oh yeah you bet so. yeah right oh yeah. yeah okay uh mike anything any feedback anything to add or concerns on this uh, update no no nothing to add i mean there's over time and in, in going in there consistently i i definitely am trending more towards not having that trail uh, just seeing the impact and seeing how much wildlife and how much everything's moving around and just i'd rather just not disturb it as even though it's going to get disturbed now which i don't know <laughs> i just don't want to bother it even more than it's going to get bothered now so that's my concern are, are you talking about the um the trail going behind the houses to connect or are you talking about any trails in the conservation land behind it at all any trail at all at this point okay Thanks for clarifying. Yeah. Yep. 
Well, it is May the 4th. I think we were just joined by Darth Vader. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, Mike. I think I, I, was that Mike Tuchel speaking? I I think your audio just got um, chopped up. I can't, can't hear you a lick. Working now. No. No. Sorry. It's okay. Just as a before we uh, move move along from this, there is actually a, a question that was submitted in writing by one of the um, uh, the attendees. He's a neighbor. Oh. A bus, so. Thanks, Rory. I'll Q&A. I'll go ahead and read that question now. Um, Andrea, please ask when and if appropriate. Uh, This comes from Nat Eldridge, 1 Rollins Road. My concern is that a low-lying area on our property acts as a catchwater basin from surrounding properties when sufficient precipitation causes runoff. When the water level gets high enough in our low-lying area, it goes under Highland Highland Street uh, through a culvert and runs through the property on the other side of the road and eventually ends up in the river that goes through the town of Easton's property, which borders the sawmill development. My question is, will the changes by sawmill development to the wetlands and its surrounding lands impact the pre-development water level height in the wetlands during, for example, a 10 year, 24 hour storm? My concern, if the water level increases in the wetlands, that it might impact the drainage from our property to the river during heavy rains. Thank you. And I don't know if that Mike's back. I'm here, here, here. Oh. Mike, you might want to call in in a cell. Okay. Yeah. Where's the property that he's calling about? It's south of the. It's south of the um, site. Oh. Rollins is is on the south side of Highland, so it's. Um, it, yeah. So he's talking about downstream. He's talking about a downstream impact. So clearly, it's clearly. Um, an issue that we will be addressing when we get to the bordering land subject to flooding and the compensatory storage. Um, And so Mm -hmm. it's really great to hear um, the specific uh, conditions already. Uh, Chances are we can't make the specific conditions, today's conditions better, but we're not supposed to make it worse. We're just not, we haven't, we're not ready to answer that question though, I don't think. We're waiting for the engineering for that to answer that question uh, more specifically. Um, so this recording, this uh, video uh, meeting is getting, being recorded. I'm assuming that means that uh, any questions are captured also. But just in case. Get back to them. I'm going to copy it and email it over to Keith. Perfect. For the minutes. So Nat, thank you for uh, your question. I don't know if we can answer it right now. Mike's having some technical difficulties. Um, I'm but I'm sure. gonna email it over to Keith uh, to have it captured in the minutes. I'm not sure if we've heard from John Thomas yet either. Yeah, I mean, nope. I guess I guess my my main concerns with it is, you know. I don't see the big picture yet. I don't see any trail system being proposed. I don't see any mitigation. Um, you know, I'm just, I'm really, before I make a decision on like how I feel with any sort of design loadout, I want to see the whole entire thing. Um, you know, so I, I think it would be beneficial just to, you know, for them to kind of give us uh, potential all, all nuts and bolts kind of design. And then I can just take a look and see what needs to be tweaked. Yeah, no, I I, um, I agree. I think we've every time we've gotten together, we've brought up that you know we haven't seen the the full mitigation that that we know we're going to need. Um, they're daylighting a stream that gets brought up all the time. It's it's on our property, right? Uh, you know, a significant portion of it at least, which is which is interesting. I mean, daylighting it certainly probably has some value in getting rid of it being buried underground. Um, but this is all supposed to be, you know, technically this is all supposed to be on the applicant's property, right? All right. the mitigation. So it's a little abnormal. Um, 
There is an option so though it, to to mitigate off-site, um, at least under the State Wetland Protection Act, they do provide that that um, ability for an applicant to do that. Hey, Stefan, yeah. I, I think sure. Mike might. Um, oh, there he is. Yeah. Oh, let's see. I just done. I it just brought him up. Okay. Um, so you know, dealing in the stream is great, but does that offset all the impacts of the rest of the development? Well, no. There, there are. This is Mike. Come back. Can you hear me now? Okay. Hi, yes. Yes. All right. Much better. Thank you, Mike. So there are two wetland replication areas in addition to the stream daylighting that that provide uh, the area replacement and provide the habitat replacement um, for the impact. So we've got the area up, up in the north, replication area A, which we've, we've put. Oops. We didn't share his screen again. We lost him. We lost him. We lost him. Oh, we did. Hmm. Well, um, he, but if, if I remember correctly from the past meeting, the the other mitigation area, you know, the the the, the area comparison just pales in co uh, comparison to the impact area. Um, Under the, the original, mean any, not anymore. Really, still. Uh, area, I mean, I, I haven't looked at the down. comparison numbers, but well, we we he didn't change the size of the mitigation area. But he isn't filling three three of the isolated wetlands. He's like back. Four. Now, in his table, did he show the mitigation areas compared to the impact areas, though? Well, he uh, when we get him back, I, he's supposed to be in here um, under. But, but I think I think we have to be a little bit careful to to only be looking to mitigate um, activity within the wetlands themselves. Because there's uh, there's other impacts that are happening in all the buffer zones, um, so, so right. I I, th I think we have to account for that as well, given this diverse <laughs> network that we've got going on here in this area. I, I don't I I just don't yeah. think it, it's a straight. This is what this is what's in the wetlands. We're going to replicate that somewhere else. That's one part of it. I think we're talking about we have all sorts of waivers where they're working within the no disturb zone. Um, that they really do need to account for. And as well, they need to account for work in the buffer zones. Um, because those, Exactly. Those and that, that was a point that we brought up. Sorry, sorry. Roy, no, no, go, go ahead. You know, as long as we're on the same page here. So. <clears throat> um, yeah, and I think it was a point that we brought up previously when we were looking at some of the tables and their mitigation area was, I don't know, let's just say for argument's sake, I don't have it in front of me, 2,500 square feet. And then you went to their total impact area, and it was like a hundred thousand square feet. That doesn't that doesn't jive. No, it doesn't. Uh, but the, so um, not even are, it's actually, it's actually my, kind of the the it's an inverse relationship of what it should be. I, um, I do want to I do want to point well, out to Mike, who's back, um, that the local standard uh, hi, is a two to one mitigation, not one to one, and then the buffer zone impacts. Yes, is on top of that. The, the wonderful thing, in my personal opinion, my professional opinion, the wonderful thing is that you have conservation land that we otherwise wouldn't have a chance to address, and we have we have the ability to enhance the 50-foot buffer zone in our own conservation land uh, with private funds. And you might want to consider that as a positive thing um, if you're bringing the public if you if you have the ability to bring the pub that site, um, and I and given the other conservation areas in the in this area, um, there's some good walking to be done. Mike has Mike has already shown us that. But um, well, there are some other potential public water, interest uh, projects on other conservation properties too. Yeah, but just this just this land, you'll never get back to this land. So I I just personally right. I personally think. It's a real opportunity that um, that this proponent is willing to address if you're willing to give them guidance. And I also so I have, I mean, I think the guidance is 
you know, look at the regs and the requirements that we've, requi we've required in the past. Um, we've got to treat applicants coming before us now fairly with applicants that we've treated in the past um, and treat projects as equally as we can. Um, you know, again, I, th I think our guidance that, that we've heard from around the table so far is generally, um, you know, step in the right direction. We need to see the bigger picture with the mitigation and, you know, come come to us with um, kind of your, your best your best foot forward with the mitigation plan, knowing that work inside the, the, the wetlands that requires the waiver work is going to need a two to one mitigation and work inside the buffer zone is going to require mitigation as well. And yeah, I think I think I'm open to having them do uh, mitigation work on other conservation properties. Um, you know, I, I, I realize that the site that they're working on is kind of tight for mitigation spots. Uh, there, there's not a lot of area for them to do the mitigation on. So I, I'm open to proposals. Stefan, so this, this point, is Mike. Oh, um, can I ask a question before we go any further? So I, I understand, yeah. I understand, you know, the, 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 rep, the mitigation, the replication, whatever you want to call it for resource areas. Are you saying that you have a square footage mitigation requirement for buffer zone? Restoration. I don't think it's a two. I, no, I don't think it's a quantity. I think it's. Although you can get to quantity when you say no significant impact. <laughs> a lot of uh, by yeah. case law, by, by, by case review, um, I, if I can speak for the commission, it's often it, mm -hmm. it's often done on a, this square feet of impact is often a, a, is often enhanced. 50, the same area of a 50 foot buffer zone. Of the 50 foot buffer zone. The inner 50 foot, um, Rory might, you, Rory was, was quite eloquently speaking to the inner 50 foot buffer zone as um, a key resource area in town. Now that you've, now that you're out of the actual wetland line, he didn't want you to forget that the inner 50 foot is, um, a no disturb zone. Rory, do you want to say it better? No, I mean, I, I think that, that that's one of the things that, that, you know, is going to be important for us to understand the impact of this is, is, is now that we've sort of addressed much of the actual work inside the wetlands themselves, which was our uh, initial concern, is that we need to also be aware of the impacts within the 50 foot no disturbed zones or the, you know, the, the 100 foot and the vernal pool. So, um, you know, I, I think those are significant resource areas. In addition to, in, in our bylaw, the buffer zones themselves, the outer buffer zones are resource areas as well. We need to understand when we're talking about impact to resource areas that we're including those impacts as well, not just restorations to the actual wetlands themselves and, and mitigations for that. So. I think that's part of it. Mm -hmm. I, I will. I will say that that certainly daylighting the the stream um, is going to create wildlife habitat that does not exist. Um, so there is a value to doing that, and, and certainly I, I think you should get, um, um, you know, um, should be able to count that towards uh, the wildlife habitat impact that you're trying to overcome. So. Um, I think that that's uh, significant. So I, those are just my comments and an overarching understanding the impact, not just being what's being done inside the wetlands themselves, but you've got a pretty big wetland system on that western part of the, the site, which I know you know because you, you've worked this these plans for, for many months now, um, and you've been very respectful of that and listened to what we have to say. And, and uh, So I think that's about it. Yeah, and you guys have done a wonderful, uh, you know, habitat and um, and uh, nature study there. So there is um, the retaining wall adjacent to Vernal Pool or Wetland F that does um, reduce the quality of that 50-foot inner uh, buffer zone for that particular isolated vegetated wetland. Um, there's some fragmentation, I would say, especially for amphibians. If they're if they're moving in that direction from wetland E to eastbound, um, 
are moving outside of wetland F if they happen to be um, happen to be using that area um, as a refuge. So there there is some some of that uh, 50 foot inner buffer zone isn't is I would have to say the quality isn't as high as say perhaps the 50 foot buffer zone associated with H. Okay. And, and commentary like that can help us, uh, you know, coming okay. from from an expert, uh, can you know, can help guide us. Um, okay. So you know, in in um, your kind of next uh, salvo here, um, that's that's very helpful, uh, you know, to us uh, as far as you know particular areas of the the wetland system that may be higher or lesser quality uh, based on observations and natural obstructions that are that are existing. Um, so that's that's good to know. Um, all right, so guys, we're, we're coming up on I think a little almost an hour here yeah. on this one. Um, I think we need to move on. Uh, Mike, do you need any other big um, feedback from us? Do, do you think you have enough to chew on? I think we do. Um, and and I guess the the question is going to be, do we want to try to meet in two weeks to talk about waiver requests, or or do we want to go a little further out in order to be able to Look at things like flipping the driveways and houses and such. Well, uh, what's your what did you want to talk about related to waiver requests? Because yeah, I mean, typically, um, you know, we we see the the plans, the mitigation, the waiver request kind of all in all in one shot. Did you have a particular question or concern around the waiver request? Yeah, no, I, and I and I think right now I have draft waiver requests in to Andrea, but they're they're based on the original. Uh, notice of intent alternative, not this new alternative. The numbers are anyway. So we would need to revise those. So rather than waste your time, you know, in two weeks talking about the waiver requests right now, I can work with Andrea just on the format of the request to make sure that the format looks like what um, she and you are used to seeing and then come back in four weeks because that, that only gives us two weeks to generate the information. I'd have to get information, Andrea, in two weeks in order to be able to come back to the commission in four weeks. So I think that's probably a better way to go. So I think we we should Sounds continue good. for the, is it four weeks out? Is that second meeting out, Andrea? She's muted. Andrea, you're muted. Oh, hang on, hang on, Andrea. Oh. Yeah, there we go. Uh, there yeah, we I think go. the first meeting in June is June 6th. It's, uh, June okay. 6th. okay. June eighth. Um, June eighth. Okay. I'm gonna so say I, that's a Saturday. I'm not doing that. I have one more thing to add to this, and I don't know if it's been discussed, but you know, in projects like I've worked on this before, we're doing a big development, uh, you know, in the past, and we always thought about potentially conservation restrictions and things like that. So I don't know if that was potentially something, Mike, that you have taken into consideration oh. for this project. I've not talked to Rick about that, no. Okay. Um, let me say from the from the planning board perspective, there are three conserv there are three areas of open space and the conservation commission will no, the planning board will be looking to conservation for uh, recommendations on management of those areas. One of them is the is the open land here on the western side. The second is the open land around the wetland to the east of the main entrance to the property. And the third is the clubhouse. So I imagine you would have an opinion on the ownership and management and protection of two of those three areas. Yeah, I mean, when I was working on some projects, it was a real simple, easy uh, form of mitigation. And the commission was very uh, appreciative of the effort that, you know, as a consultant we were doing. So it's just an, you know, it's a recommendation to look into it and see if it would, you know, jive with the project. Would okay. that mean that we would not have to replicate some of the buffer zone uh, impacts that we're proposing? No, I think you're going to do, I think you're going to have, um, into buck under the planning board you're going to have to give um uh ownership and uh probably probably ownership and protection is probably going to happen in the planning board anyways if they may if the conservation commission makes that recommendation okay so there's no trade-off 
um, through you have the a public interest. You have a public interest that is a, above and beyond um, mitigate. You first you mitigate the mitigation, and then you and then you provide for public interest. Okay. Okay. Did uh, Mike? Right. Did you hear John Thomas's comment earlier about needing to see the big picture? Again, yes. it was one. It was one of those really eloquent ones. Make sure you heard it. Yes, I did. Okay. All right. Um, um, something that came up in my conversation with Mike um, offline was um, that the daylighting. Um, big fan, is um, on conservation land. Um, John, uh, you're, are you comfortable with the fact that mitigation that enhances conservation properties is, you know, even though it's offsite, it may be, it may be a, a conservation land, this conservation land may be well suited to provide that. And then it gets an end gets enhanced, she says. <laughs> I mean, it's an overall benefit. I think we brought this up, uh, you know, to oh, a week ago, a week ago, right, Keith? Yeah, a week ago. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be a good, it's a good, good picture, good item to be addressed. I think it's going to help the town land itself. Um, it's just, you know, how does that translate to the overall project of this and who is responsible for what actions and whatnot? I think that needs to be laid out. Um, you know, who's going to manage that if there needs to be any sort of management or anything like that. I think that's kind of what I'm, I would be more concerned about is who's going to be responsible if anything goes awry. Good comment. Sounds good. I would like to add something uh, to help re uh, help streamline the review of this application. I move that all future files uploaded to Permanize uses some kind of file naming convention that reflects the order in which the files were posted. So it is, it's the date at the back. Can we have it at the front? So that's, it's, it's, it's the that's, same. That's, that's permitized convention, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's frustrating, right? Great thought, Carol. Really frustrating. That's a great thought, Carol. But we can't, you know, the, the person who's uploading the file can't also put the date in front of the file name. Yeah, they can they can make they can name it anything they want. The, the date it's posted will be at the very end, also. Okay, so can we also put it at the beginning? Can the you know the person who's naming the file put the date at the beginning? That's what I'm requesting. I, That's my motion. I can do that. Thank you. And the uh, the, the the habitat uh, report. That was a lot, a lot, a lot of pages. So I'd like to see all sheets or pages in each document be numbered sequentially, starting with one. <laughs> Otherwise, we have these these bits and pieces that are like page six of eight, page seven of eight, and then in this ninety-page document, it's hard to reference and skip back to. So that okay. would be a big help. Yep, we can do page and, and number gonna... two. Thank you. Um, if we're going to be naming from things, a hard we need copy, a convention. wouldn't you? Say again. Would you benefit from a hard copy of the wildlife habitat? No, I, no. Okay, good. Because just just checking, it's yes. actually kind of hard to do in, when we're working remotely. Yeah, appreciate it. Like just go if we're going to be requesting that, which I think it's a good idea, we we should settle on a format because uh, that way we have a standard and uh, hopefully something that stays in order. Um, I mean, off the top of my head, like 01, 02, 2020. But then if you have submissions that span years, uh, not necessarily going to be in order. So do we, in, instead, do we want to just start with like one through 10,000, um, you know, basically document 00001, 00002, 00003 instead of a date? That way it's just numbered sequentially. Sure, that would be fine too. A thousand will that do makes it. Sense. <laughs> yeah, I haven't, yeah true. I haven't seen anything go, go beyond a thousand. Yep. E yep. Either that, Stefan, or the first four digits would be the year. So it would be 2020, 
then the month, oh, four. And then we can the, take care of this. Two digits. Yeah. We, we, can, we can take care yeah, of this. We'll figure out. We'll, we'll, find, we'll find a format. Yeah. And, but just, I just want to make sure it'll be nice and sequential and, and stay that way and not jump around while we're changing years and all that. Um, great. Okay. Um, motion to continue um, 560 Foundry to June 8th. One dean second. Uh, actually, wait, wait, one moment. Uh, any public comment on uh, 560 Foundry Street? Seeing no hands raised. I'll give it a minute. Some more Q and A. Okay, now I'll do that motion to continue 560 Foundry to June 8th. Can I get a second? Tom a second. Thank you, sir. All those in favor? Cole Sills, aye. Lundin, aye. Spadia, aye. Thomas, aye. Catino, aye. All right. Uh, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Lori. Uh, appreciate Thank all you. the work you put out in the field, Lori. Uh, great report. Thanks. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good night, you guys. Okay, 5 Calvin Road, Certificate of Compliance. Yes, uh, 5 Calvin Road was a, a septic upgrade that was approved um, in December of 2019. The uh, project came before you in um, for a Certificate of Compliance. It first came before you in uh, March and you asked to continue the, the uh, request for a certificate of compliance because of uh, the site wasn't stabilized. There was a question as to whether or not there was any, um, a curtain drain that was supposed to be at the base of the septic um, was in place and uh, there was no permanent medallions. I can tell you that the, the excavator for this project who does not live in the area has been going above and beyond to get this thing set. He has um, he has seeded it. Um, he has got medallions on the um, in on the fence line facing the location. He did put up a fence, but he didn't anchor it, so it's not really that useful. Um, but he did put us. Uh, he did uh, drop hay. Um, scattered hay along the um, seed to kind of help hold it in place. So the area isn't stabilized with vegetation, but I do believe it is stabilized. And with the fence acting as an effective barrier to the wetland beyond it, um, I, I think the I think the project has gone as far as it can um, at this point in time. You can either do a partial if you want full stabilization. Um, or or complete that's your uh, call but do uh, include the as a perpetual condition number 48 which is uh, no debris in the wetland or any debris that gets there should be removed and I don't I don't know if I can give you a good visual on this site it actually um, there's a stockade fence along the the side the, the separating the lawn from the wetland on two sides. So there's really no way to physically walk into the wetland from this property. So the wetland is pretty well protected from this property. Okay. I'd like to make a motion to issue a uh, certificate of compliance for five Calvin Road noting that the condition number 48 should continue as a perpetual condition. Second, Catino, second. All those in favor? Call cells, aye. Lundy, aye. Spady, aye. Thomas, aye. Catino, aye. All right, excellent. Um, next up, the 34 Brentwood Road Dam Enforcement Update. 
Okay, I do not see in the attendees, um, Mr. McLaughlin. We didn't. Unless it's that 774 number. Can we ask who you are, 774? Oh, hi, this is Chris Patrick. I'm oh. just listening in. You're allowed. Oh, hey. Hi, Chris. <laughs> hi. So, um, 34 Brentwood is a um, is an a, an authorized dam that came to our attention because of um, an upstream uh, property the owned by Ms. Welcome, who was concerned about the potential effect uh, back in October. Well, hang on. Um, they're not here to give us an update. Did, did they send you any information on elevations? Anything that we requested? No, the last um, the last uh, communication with him, with Mr. McLaughlin, who's the son of the owner, was um, a couple weeks ago, it was last week, when he said that um, his preferred option is to remove the boards and and pictorially document the impact of doing so. Right. So I believe it was back in January yes. they were before us and we asked them for elevation information upstream and downstream so that we could maybe form an educated decision here. Uh, they didn't get anything to us, uh, which is kind of annoying. Uh, it's also come to my attention that they've had some utility work done across the, uh, uh, the, the culvert there uh, just above the dam. Uh, I don't know if that qualifies for any exemptions or anything like that, but apparently the, the electrical service was totally redone to the barn that's up there. Um, so like a trench dug across uh, and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, all work done within Riverway and all that. Um, so they're not here to give us the information we requested. We can't really make an educated decision on what to do about the dam. I myself am leaning towards um, some kind of stage removal of the boards. I, I was able to get out there a few weeks ago and actually put my eyes on it. And yeah, those boards are absolutely new within the last couple of years. Um, the, the lower boards, um, you know, there's, they look, uh, they're in fantastic shape. Um, and you can, you can definitely tell if it's relatively new pressure treated wood. Um, you can also tell uh, that whether they've been boarded for a long time or intermittently over periods of time. You can tell that water has been flowing around the boards in the, uh, the concrete um, pads because of the, uh, the erosion to the concrete. Um, and at some point in the future, the erosion is going to cause the dam to just fail anyways. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's my opinion, but I'm also concerned about downstream effects to, you know, the properties down there because we know we've had a lot of water issues with properties down on, on Bay Road and um, some of the side streets. Um, so I, I don't know, I, I don't personally feel comfortable making that decision right now without some of that uh, downstream watershed information. I don't know how you guys feel about it. Um, so I guess I'd open it up to you, to, to you guys there. I, I would like to see more info before I make any decision, for sure. Same here. Of course, I want to see more info, too. Yeah. Rory, I'm assuming. He's muted. Oh, you're muted. I'm still muted. I'm muted. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think we've told the applicant many times we want more information. I don't think that's seen. Yeah. So we're dealing with an enforcement order. I not a fan of like issuing fines or anything like that, but I mean, it, he kind of prodded us and now he's not here. We're, I mean, we're in a crazy time. Who knows what's going on? Maybe he has some personal issues related to the whole virus situation. Who knows? Um, our next meeting is not in a cup for a couple of weeks. We want to ask Andrew and Keith to reach out and, I will do that. It, I don't know. The, the initial letter that we sent, the letter of inquiry, is a classic mm -hmm. three option. Um, you know, get it permitted, show us it already is, or remove it. 
And he came, he came after that meeting in January, he came back and said, you know what, I'm going to take that third option and ask to have it removed. But I think it's completely, um, you're saying, to, you're saying tonight, perhaps we weren't clear. We, you can't remove it until we know more about it now that it's been there. And that's a perfectly fair. Oh, answer. yeah. Well, and I think, yeah, I think that's correct. And, and I think when we talked to them before, you had mentioned that DEP's standards for removal is uh, kind of a more full-blown, like uh, a deeper study of the upstream and downstream effects. And I think we're just trying to understand that we're not totally going to screw somebody by removing the boards on this, on this dam. I mean, and maybe, you know, looking at the elevations and, and the watershed won't guarantee that, that nobody's going to have some problems by pulling these boards, but at least we can have a better idea um, of the potential impacts of pulling the boards. Yeah, we've had we've had those neighbors on Pheasant Lane in, in on every hearing for 222 Bay Road that that we we've, we've had. So I mean, they every single time they talk about the, the the water running across their lawns and everything else. And I think we just have to be cognizant that 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 we're not meant to in, we're going to try and not impact their their water situation as it is. We can't fix it, but we shouldn't make it worse. Right. So I, I think that I think that Andrea has to reach out and get an update from them about what they're doing. I mean, wow. We've already said we're not going to deal with 222 Bay Road until we get this handled. So I, I don't. We we're trying to motivate them to get in, get this taken care of. So. I think I, I think it would be right. best um, to give them a time limit to get that information in. I agree. Two weeks. I can't or... be done in two weeks. He needs a, he needs some. He needs some help. It should have been done. Can it be done? I, I don't know. Can it be done? Give, in two give weeks? him give give him the two weeks. Give him the two weeks, and he'll come back in two weeks and say, "Ah, I can't okay. get it done in two weeks." Okay. All right. He's here talking to us. If we give him a month, he's going to take six months. I mean, it's okay. Got it. It's it's been four months. <laughs> That's two my weeks. opinion. <laughs> like he's gotta he's gotta come in two weeks. Or, or, I mean, or what do we do? I mean, we're just talking about it every two weeks, which is ridiculous. Right. So what if he's in the hospital? Well, that, that I can certainly find That's out. a different situation. Yeah, that legit, right? That's a totally different situation. If he's in the hospital, then he's in the hospital and we're just going to have to wait. I really hope he's not in the hospital. Um, I got it. Okay, two weeks. Okay. Upstream and downstream, level of level of the boards, water elevations, upstream and downstream, catchment area. Cool. Um, all right. So before we get to your updates, any um, questions in the, from the audience? Any raised hands? All right, cool. Um, so before we get to the environmental planner updates, um, I wanted to bring something uh, before the board. Um, and I'm gonna allow Chris Patrick to, uh, to jump in here if he feels uh, necessary. So the, the flyaway trails, um, that the Eagle Scouts just completed some trail work on, and I'm going to share some information here. All right, you guys can see my screen? Yes. Yep. Yeah, they're getting destroyed, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty wet in, uh, in some sections. They, um, you know, Chris, Jonathan Chase, and Alex Rhodes, they, they did a lot of site walking prior to proposing the project. Um, we're having a really wet spring. Uh, from my understanding, they, they knew that there were gonna be some areas um, that they were maybe gonna need some additional bridging over. Um, and there are definitely some areas that could use some additional bridging. Uh, now, Alex's proposed project is complete. 
Um, I've ridden it a few times. I've hiked it a number of times and, uh, the property, um, the, the portions of the property that it opens up are just, it's gorgeous back there. It's, it's a beautiful, um, access, uh, to, to the conservation properties. And, um, I, I haven't been on there in a few weeks. Um, oh. but when I did, I, I saw more and more people enjoying it, uh, which was great. And I think they've done a great service. Um, now his part of the project is complete. And so we're at the point where if we want to do additional bridging, um, it's going to cost some money uh, and it's going to cost some man hours and labor and such things. Um, and uh, Chris has the, uh, the team for the labor and doing the work. Um, and they're just short on the, uh, the, the funds and the, mostly basically the materials. Um, so given what the, um, the scouts have done for, you know, trail work in the town um, and uh, all, all that they've kind of given to the community as far as, uh, you know, labor, working on the trails, you know, raising their own funds to, um, uh, to, to fund a lot of these trails. I'd like to propose that we um, dedicate some of our own conservation funds to purchasing some materials to kind of finish out this project and make this trail um, a little more sustainable in the long run by putting some bridging over these areas um, that, you know, through a, a wetter season that we've had in the last couple of years um, has exposed some, uh, some areas that could use some additional bridging. And I wanted to see uh, what you guys thought about that. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Oh yeah, no, just one more thing. You know, Chris went out there and he did some measuring and he came up with a total estimate uh, you know, needed for materials of a little over six thousand dollars. Oh nice. Um so I'll I'll open it up to you guys as far as you know how you feel about um you know dedicating some conservation funds to purchasing some materials um to kind of finish out this trail and make it the most sustainable trail that it can be. Um, and then, you know, the, the idea would be that Chris and his team would, uh, dedicate the labor and the man hours to, uh, to getting the work done. Yeah. I'm, I'm out on that trail every single day. That's not even an exaggeration. Uh, and it can, it's rapidly declining as far as, well, it's unfortunate. I'm a mountain biker. I'll speak for us. They are really getting after it right now and making some seriously big holes with all the mud. Uh, so yeah, absolutely the money should definitely be put there to build some bridges. It, it needs it or it needs to be closed down for a bit just so it can dry up because it's just, it's getting destroyed. Mm -hmm. Well, um, uh, thank you for, uh, Chris, for making that uh, detailed budget proposal. That's fantastic. Um, it's great that the trails are getting used so much. You know, some areas in the state don't allow biking until April, after April 15th. I wonder if that's something mm -hmm. to think about. Yeah, so um, actually that restriction has been changed in the state. Um, it used to be uh, April 15th restriction. The DCR no longer um, uses an April 15th date and they monitor on a week by week basis. Um, and so they release a note every year to um, entities that um, advocate for mountain biking and connect us with their decision. Um, this year, they didn't even um, close trails for a period of time when they normally would, and usually it's March. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know that it would be possible um, on a town-owned land to um, exclude the use during seasonal, um, you know, sort of trail uh, issues to a specific user group. Um, it, I don't even know that the state really has the ability to do it effectively. Um, so my choice is to, rather than excluding a user group, it, it group is to find a mitigation that um, allows the trail to be more sustainable on a year-round basis. Um, and when I do my trail work layouts, um, I try to use the least amount of wood as possible. I was explaining this to Stefan earlier today when we had a chat about this. Um, you know, in some of these pictures here, I'm not actually going to be installing bridge. I'm going to be 
using any loose rock that's in the area. And I go rock harvesting all over as long as it's not a stone wall. And I go find flat pieces of rock and I put it into the trail bed and create um, a surface. Um, so some of these pictures are just like not even really wet mud. It's just mud, soft, like uh, I call it duff, which is like that layer of decomposing leaves and sticks and twigs. Yeah, the dirt and, really isn't set up yet. Yeah, the dirt, it, there isn't really dirt in a lot of these sections. Right. It's just a, it's still like a one foot le deep layer of like almost bog. <laughs> um, exactly. you know, like peat bog. And so, um, and when we walked it back in, it, it was actually April 7th of last year. Um, we were at a different time. We weren't anywhere near as wet. Um, and I, I was, I was a little hesitant in a few of these areas where you see, for example, that temporary wood across the wet there in one of those pictures, I was a little hesitant to, um, advocate for no bridge being built there and here we are and I, i've you know we should have put some some decking there yeah. um and so here we are i at the same time you know we have an eagle scout who had to raise um i think he almost raised four thousand dollars for his project on his own a uh, 17 year old boy um and he built out this trail under our watch uh, i think and when i first uh, 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 you know recognize that we needed to do this um whenever i would see people out on the trail when we were doing the last bit of punching out um they would they would tell us how much they love the trail and i and then some of the folks that i knew were even saying well um there's some mud what can we do to help um and i said well stay tuned um because if you want to carry a board or two i can put you to work and and so i've got a bunch of people on a list that are ready to, to, to help that are even abutters that are ready to contribute to the cause. Um, so sorry for the long winded sort of description, but I, that's kind of where I would want to take it. Yeah. Sounds like a great job. My only other question would be, do you, what do you think about requesting number funding? Yeah, I, I have requested number funding and I'm in the middle of trying to get that nailed down. Um, it's uh, it's a work in progress because um, I have to get a board to agree to, to support money for it. Um, but I can guarantee you're going to get probably $20,000 worth of NEMBA labor that I, I can get to come volunteer for the job. So that I can guarantee. That sounds fine. Yeah. <laughs> Volunteer labor has a value whenever I apply for these grants. Um, and uh, I can guarantee that we'll get a ton of volunteer labor for this project. In fact, I got a, I actually helped Alex with some of his labor reach out, not directly because I don't like to um, sort of step in the way of an independent Eagle project, but I did give him the necessary resources so that he could reach out to NEMBA. And he did have some people show up from NEMBA for some of his trail work days. Fantastic. So Chris, do you think that, um, are you looking for the full 6K plus from us or do we think there's other fundraising opportunities out there or should we allocate the money that we feel comfortable with and maybe look for other fundraising opportunities? I'll tell you what I would prefer. I was actually quite surprised um, uh, uh, with this sort of, a statement made by Stefan that maybe we should have a talk about this kind of a concept. Um, what I what I would prefer, since it's on the table, is I would like to be able to fundraise um, with the folks that have that have sort of walked by me and said, "We'll give you a hundred bucks to help get some more bridges built." But I know that I can't close a six thousand dollar gap with the Walker buys and maybe even five hundred from Nemba. Um, so, I mean, if, if I bet you I could probably raise a thousand, um, I don't know. I don't know how much further I could raise. So, I mean, I, I would, I would maybe you, you, maybe a co-offer would be acceptable, you know, 5,000 or, and then I can work to close the gap for the remaining. Um, and then we could revisit this and, you know, as I go through the project, my goal is to get this built in 2020 so that it, it gets, in fact, if I could get uh, access to capital, I would 
be buying the materials tomorrow and having them delivered at a trailhead to start the project of moving the, uh, the material in. Is there also an opportunity for us to ask um, Fernandes to supply the, the materials at their cost as opposed to retail? How did they do with Eagle Scouts? So the Eagle, the Eagle Scouts typically went out and tried to find the lowest price lumber and, and, and um, within a reasonable distance to town. Um, I think both Alex and uh, uh, Max used um, a Lowe's product. Um, when I did the, in 2011, when I um, was able to get the town an RTP grant for $17,000, I used Fernandes lumber. And, and the great thing about Fernandes was he was able to stage the lumber at his uh, lumber yard as I need it and deliver it as I need it, which was nice because he kept it in a dry spot and I could make a call and say, all right, we have a work weekend coming up. Could you deliver me 15 of these and 20 of these? And boom, I was in business. Um, as far as far as getting a price break, I think you just ask. I don't know that we could get it. It's not a guarantee. I think it's worth having the, the conversation. Um, so I, I am fully in favor of this. I mean, I've already seen people talking about those those uh, those trails up in Flyway Ponds, and the fact that there was a conversation just this week about the dam that's up there, and people wanting to know more about it, the history of it. Yeah. Um, that people never would have been up there had had these trails not been built already. So, um, kudos to the, the work that the Eagle Scouts have done and the support you've shown to the Eagle Scouts over the years, and your your undying support to the mountain biking association and community so um you know, really I, I really appreciate everything you've, you've done chris for um this community and it, ongoing your commitment is, is outstanding so um you have you know, certainly my support and i would support a motion um to to allocate funds to support this project in a bigger as big a way as as is needed to get it done great Anybody else? I'll second that. I'm a huge advocate of trail maintenance. I'm doing it myself and Sharon. So, um, awesome. I definitely think it's a valid, especially with this kind of COVID thing going on. I think it's definitely great for everybody to try to get out and try to use the trails. And yeah. And, um, right. Right. And uh, Andrew, if we, if we allocate the full amount requested and, and let's just say we get a break on, on materials um and it comes in under can excess funds be returned to the conservation fund yeah it, it could it could certainly be a reimbursement uh, that often awards are um but i think we should use the the town the town should can support it by um having giving our tax exempt number um you know and, and not to exceed when you make the motion make it a not to exceed Oh yeah, thanks you for the reminder. Uh, when I did do the RTP grant, we did submit a tax exempt um, form to Fernandes. Thank you. For yeah, that. makes a difference. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Okay. Yep. Good point. So you have and, your own tax Andrew, exempt we, number, uh, and Chris. Uh, no, when I when I did the um, purchasing at Fernandes, we bought it as a lump sum, um, and I believe it was paid for directly through. Um, conservation bill. and then there yep. was a tax number given i believe yeah that that's true um it wasn't a reimbursement we have yeah if we could i could i can work on that with fernandes easily but anyways i we've got that's one of the aspects of it is to use the town's tax exempt number for the towns for town okay. materials yeah that sounds great okay. um so, and, and um oh sorry go ahead carol oh sorry so um, so now it's coming up with an amount. Chris, you said you thought you could raise it a thousand dollars. So, um, what does the commission want to commit to? Well, I mean, personally, I'd I'd commit up to sixty five hundred because I don't know what his number is. I know that Chris isn't going to go spend the money unnecessarily, and if Chris can raise a thousand dollars, he's going to. It's the kind of guy that Chris is. He wants the community involved, and he knows if people put not just sweat labor in, but you know, maybe 
$100 at a time that they're going to be more committed to the project as well. So I have no problem allocating the, the full amount plus a little bit more to just to have him to have some wiggle room, um, knowing that, that he'll probably only spend four or 5000 of it. I mean, that's just, you know, I, I trust Chris to, to not go spend the money just because we gave it to him. He's going to do what he was said he was going to do. Um, that would be my my uh, thought process on this. To be quite honest, I, I I would I would make a motion not to exceed sixty five hundred if if I was to make a motion. I I agree with Rory and, and Chris. If you need rocks, I got plenty. So <laughs> <laughs> lots of rocks in East. Mike rock I, I honestly think a lot of it could be cleared up with those rocks. I, I know you guys are kind of doing that in some of those spots, and it it works really well. So yeah, that's the plan for a bunch a of Andrew. Areas. Would we have to? Andrew, would we have to specify a fund that it's coming from? Would it just um, come from the, the general later. conservation fund? It's the conservation trust fund, I assume. Your only other choice would be um, the Tufts farm, and that money is um, yeah. got a lot of capital improvements needed over there. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I'll second um, Rory's motion on the not to exceed $6,500 uh, well, 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 and let, just let, noting let me, that it comes. So you're gonna you're gonna make the motion. So because I didn't make the motion. So go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. <laughs> um, I'll make a motion to allocate up to sixty five hundred dollars from the conservation trust fund uh, to complete the flyaway trail project uh, as proposed by Chris Patrick uh, for materials um, to uh, to put up more bridges to make the trail more sustainable for the future. Second. Sorry, I, was there a second? I didn't hear. You had two seconds. You two. One, one second. Oh, I had two. All right, great. <laughs> great. All those in favor. Call Phil Zai. Lundy night. Spady, aye. Chris, call me when you need help. Yep. Thomas, aye. Chris, you can give me a. Uh, you can get in eye. contact with me too. I'll help you if you need it. Awesome. More helpers, better. Thank you all. I really Great. appreciate awesome. this. Good job, Chris. Thank you, Chris. We appreciate you. you, Chris. All right, I'll be in touch. Send me your send me all your right, Google care. Drive file, uh, folder. Will do. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. All right. Thank you guys for hearing me out on that. Okay, uh, Andrea, planner updates. Wow, try to beat that. That's pretty impressive. Um, I got the trail <laughs> signs posted for trail use and the safety rules for the community garden are posted. I got them laminated. Can you believe it? Um, that was the that was what I did last week. Um, <laughs> um, also went also the wetland restoration for the sewer project is going to uh, begin. I was on site awesome. with Brad Holmes the project engineer and um, the, con the construction contractor, you know that there are two areas of the, at the outlets of both Old Pond and New Pond, um, there's wetlands that need restoration. Uh, one thing that came out um, literally when they, over at Old Pond, it turned out that that area of fill was actually an old dump site. Was and it really? So wow. I've gotten a few calls. Wow. Um, as they as they you know pulled out material to um, lay the pipe, they're actually finding um, tires, metal, yuck. So is that um, those tires I mentioned to you when I was driving by? Those were the ones. Those are the ones. You're not the only oh, one. Oh wow! So that was an actual dump site. It was an actual. Nice. It was an actual. Uh, you know, not not known to others, but is going to be. Um, the, the contractor is going to properly restore. Um, we're going to modify the wetland line so that um, we get rid of more yuck um, and then put in put in rocks to protect the toe so that we have a, a, a steeper slope. Um, but we're not going to lose wetland because of it. We also, you, you may recall that there was a, um, a storm drain outlet there at the old pond. And so we're creating a spillway where we didn't have one, be a rock spillway where we didn't have one before. So it won't be a vegetated section of wetland, but it'll be uh, dissipating the energy of coming 
of the stormwater coming all the way down from um, the Target Plaza. So um, it's Brad Holmes has got has got a good handle on it, and I'll stay in touch. But this is I think this is where he really shines. Um, he's going to be on this. He's going to be on it through um, rough grade, and then the planting. It should be done in the next month. Um, Great. A second, a second issue that came up. Um, I actually was down at Wheaton Farm on um, Sunday and walked the other bridge, Eagle Scout project. Um, I need to get a hold of um, the Eagle Scout and Jonathan Chase because um, this. Do you remember this, the Everett Trail Memorial? It's a little bridge behind the Wheaton Farm barn. And um, they didn't, they sanded it down, but they didn't paint it because the family of the guy, oh. the little child who it's named after, um, I was gonna do that work. Well, they haven't done the work. And so it's sitting out there with a blue tarp over it. Um, and oh. you, can't, you can't use the trail because it's got a blue tarp over the bridge. Um, you, you shouldn't use the trail because it has blue tarp over the bridge. Um, so the, I, so I want to speak to Jonathan Chase about that. See if we can't get somebody to put a, at least a, a one layer of paint so we can get rid of the blue tarp. Um, well, I mean, idea, we have a whole empty high school roster of kids. Um, anybody from, from the art department interested in potentially priming it, slapping some paint <laughs> on that it. thing. Yeah, I want to have I want yeah. to, speak to I want to get Jonathan Chase in this because the family was really um, um, wanted to be part of the project and this was their effort, but we can't have a blue tarp up there forever. So I think we have to get a hold of the family uh, first. It's been a while. I mean, I guess we can give them first rights of refusal. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like it's kind of kind of going to get done. Also, otherwise, I mean, the, the wood's going to go unprotected and it's just going to rot. And well, that's where the blue tarp comes in. But yeah, so I wanted to I want to yeah. move on that. Maybe that'll be next week's project. And um, there's a second bridge that's needed. If you if you happen to get past the blue tarp, um, the trail loops around, and you have to get over another section. Um, and I mean, there's only so much dead wood you can put in the way so that you don't get your feet wet. Hey, apparently we like building bridges. So yeah. So Chris is no longer listening, but. We need another Eagle Scout. We need another bridge. <laughs> um, the AMC two weeks ago, uh, two, sorry, two or three years ago, the AMC was going to build, uh, a, was going to restore the Bay Circuit Trail south of Rockland. Remember that? Rory's shaking his head. Um, it was an RDA because I was involved and couldn't be happier that they were going to be putting in this wetland. Um, it, uh, they're going to restore the wetland through this trail work. Um, their RDA is about to expire in June. And so they asked me for an extension. They haven't shown diligent pursuit, but that's because they're a volunteer group. And um, apparent the, 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 the time when they were going to do the work fell. It wasn't COVID, but there was a legitimate, you could not go out and work time. And I can't remember what it was because it wasn't COVID. It was triple E or something like that. It was triple, triple E. Thank you. It was that's what triple it was. E. And it was Blue Cross Blue Shield, so they weren't going to do it. Correct. Um, well, it's certainly it was not the plague do it before the pandemic. Yeah, it was before the pandemic. So um, uh, they would like an ex they would like an ex a an extension. So can we give them two more years, just in case COVID is gone by then? I, I have no problem giving them an extension. Yeah, okay. no problem. You, you might want to make I'm all about the A circuit. Do to, it to extend a, a, a determination. Of applicability for the AMC. I make a motion to extend the termination of applicability for the AMC project to put bridges in the wetlands south of Rockland. Catch you in a second. All in the favor. Call Phil's aye. Blondie aye. Spady aye. Thomas aye. Catino aye. Okay, those are my deals. Great. Thank you. Um, 
All right. Anybody think, have anything else that came up over the last uh, week? <laughs> Was this three in a row now? Yeah. <laughs> Groundhog Day within Groundhog Day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, thank you, everybody, for your time, especially in the last uh, few weeks, month and a half. Andrea, thank you for all your time and uh, effort, you know, working from home and getting all this stuff done. Um, <laughs> it's been interesting. I think I think it's been a pretty, uh, you know, successful implementation implementation of the, uh, the uh, remote meetings. Um, some have gone longer than they needed to. Uh, I think most have been pretty, pretty good, uh, but I think we're getting the hang of it. Um, and yeah, uh, the next meeting, there's a very good chance I'm not going to be at because I'm going to be, you know, up all night for days on end with a newborn baby. So may or may not see you guys in a couple of weeks. We'll see. For Marissa's sake, I probably won't see you. <laughs> if she's still pregnant in two weeks, oh man. <laughs> uh, um, well, all right. We're, well, I'm going to make a motion. We're, 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 you know, all looking forward to you becoming a father again. So, uh, you know, <laughs> thanks. Me too. Me too. Can't wait to lose some more brain cells. <laughs> um, we are pro. Well, I'm going to uh, make. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. <laughs> I'll make a motion to adjourn. Maybe a second. Oop, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor. Call Phil's aye. Lundy night. Spady aye. Thomas aye. Catino aye. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, E Cat. Thanks, Keith. Have a good, good night. night. Have a good night, guys. Take care. Bye bye. Happy daddyhood. Hope everything goes well. Yeah. <laughs>